Amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let, let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for thy people. Now, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh, Lord, my strength, my rock, and my redeemer. And the children of God said amen. And amen again. Amen. If we look at Romans, Romans, the fourth chapter. And as Reverend Beckford has already read, I just want to read that very first verse. In the very first verse, I mean the 18th verse, it says, Who against hope believed in hope? I'm going to stop right there. Who against hope believed in hope? Our next series that we have for our Bible study, we've been talking about hope and there are some that have hope and some that have false hope and some that have no hope at all and it's easy to believe in God and have hope when we can see the answer to whatever situation we might be experiencing if I go to the doctor and he or she describes medicine for me and uh, assures me that the medication that they're giving me will cure my health that I am currently experiencing. It's easy to believe that God can heal me. If my finances are a little tight, but I know that I have a large bonus that's coming at the end of the month that will cover all my expenses, it's easy to believe that God will provide for my needs. If I'm having some difficulty in my marriage, but my spouse and myself are seeing a marriage counsel together and we are starting to see some of the positive changes in our relationship, I can have hope that God is going to restore and strengthen my relationship. But on the other hand, when I can't see an answer, it's not nearly as easy to have hope. If I go to my doctor and he or she tells me that They've ran all kinds of tests, but still can't figure out what's causing my health issues. It's not easy to believe that God can heal. If my bank account has been overdrawn and, and I'm unemployed and there aren't many job opportunities available for me, then it's hard to believe that God will take care of my needs. If my spouse decides that he or she no longer wants to be married and unwilling to even see a counselor, it's pretty hard to trust God that, that he's going to somehow work the situation out. And my guess is that most of us here this morning are facing with at least one situation right now that looks hopeless because we just can't see any answer to the situation on the horizon. But I want to begin this morning by, by asking God to use this message this morning to help us find hope in the midst of a hopelessness that we are facing right now. But the good news this morning, my brothers and sisters, that no matter how hopeless my situation might look like right now, God provides the ability to have hope even if I can't see any possibility of my situation or my problem right now. In our text, my brothers and sisters, Paul begins this section with something that appears to be an oxymoron when he writes that in hope, he, Abraham, believes against hope. What Paul is really doing here is that he's using the, the, this kind of expression that contrasts two different kinds of hope. On one hand, there, there is a kind of hope that most of us are familiar with. Uh, hope that, 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 that it's really nothing more than wishful thinking. We approach hope from the perspective quite in our cultural naturally. Somebody buys a Powerball ticket. I'm not talking about anybody here. But they buy a Powerball ticket and, and they say, I hope I win the big jackpot. 
Even though the odds are only one in 292 million opportunities to win. I hope that the Knickerbockers and those that from New York know what the Knickerbockers are, the Knicks. I, I hope that they win the NBA title this year. But that's obviously it didn't work out this year. Every day when I drive down Rayford Road in the morning through that 295 construction, uh, that, that zone, and, and I hope that they actually hurry up and finish the work and get the speed limit back to normal. But again, that's only wishful thinking. But biblical hope, somebody say biblical hope. Biblical hope is much different than that. The Greek word that is translated hope means more of a confident expectation, an expectation of what is sure. And in the text, Paul and the other New Testament writers used the term where were Jews. They were, they were thinking of hope from the Hebrew mindset, which views hope as being tied directly to the promises of God. And in our text in that verse 18, Abraham believes anyway. He decided to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on the basis of what God said that he would do. In other words, Abraham had a biblical hope, even when he couldn't see any possibility of the way God had promised, but God's promises was going to be fulfilled. Here's how we, here's how we could summarize it if you, if you want to understand this biblical hope. Biblical hope is a matter of trusting that God's promises is greater than our predicament. Before we can look at these principles, let's go through and draw something from this passage. I want you to see that there's a sense of power of biblical hope by considering the, the, the dramatic differences in the life of Abraham. In the first 86 years of his life, every time Ab Abram met someone, he was reminded of the hopelessness of his situation. Just think about it, my brothers and sisters. His original name was Abram, which means exalted father. And so can you imagine his name meeting exalted father and having a conversation uh, with, with Abram? And it went like this. Hey, Abram, how you doing? God, God, good to meet you. Good to meet you, Abram. And, and I see that your name means exalted father. So tell me, Abram, how many children do you have? <laughs> you know the world is something else. And Abram, with that great embarrassment, will answer none. Even though God had promised to give him a multitude of heirs, he would, he would, reform, he would form a, a great nation and bless all nations on earth. But at the age of 86, as a result of adultery with one of Sarai's servants, Abraham, Abram finally had a son named Ishmael. And so for the next 14 years or so, Abram had the conversation would be slightly a little less embarrassing as Abram could now claim that he was an exalted father of one son. And when he was 99 years old, God comes to Abraham and, and promised him that he would have another son. And the one that who would be who would be filling the promise, God's promises that he had made to him earlier. And God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. <laughs> to Abraham. Now, when he changed his name to Abraham, the name of that name meant that he was the father of the multitude. Now, that name has an even more embarrassing name when he says Abraham because the next nine months as people talked to him and asked him his name, his name meant that he was the father of multitude. How many children he had and he could only answer I have one. And so I have to imagine that Abraham looked at the situation from his own point of view, that his life was very hopeless. But as Paul points out here in the text, even in the midst of a of a worldly hopelessness, Abraham somehow developed a biblical hope that allowed him to per persevere through long years when he couldn't see an answer to his problem. Let, let's see how we can do this and let's apply these principles that can guide our own lives. How to develop a biblical hope. The way you develop a biblical hope, first you have to consult with God. Uh, you've got to talk to God. Originally, this was going to be my second point of the message. But, but as I looked at this passage more closely, I realized that it actually needs to be the first thing that I do. 
Because right there near verse 18, we, we see these critical words which we can so easily overlook if we're not careful. And it says, as he had been told. And see, at that moment, at that moment, Abraham did give a, a, a careful consideration to his situation. But before that, he first considered the promise that God had made to him. In other words, before he can look at his circumstances through his own eyes, he had to take a look at what look at them through God's eyes. God had made a promise to him. And Abraham chose to make that prop, keep that promise that God had made to him and not his own. You see, there's an important lesson here for us, that when we're going through a situation that seems to be hopeless, the very first thing I need to do is go to the Bible. The very first thing I need to reflect on the promises that God has given to me in his word that might be applicable to my situation. Let, let me give you a, just a, a couple examples of how you might can do this. Let's just say that, that, that we're having some health issues. What, 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 what are some of the promises of God that might be applied? First, I think that it's important to point out that at least as far as I can determine, there's not a promise anywhere in the Bible that God will heal his children from every physical ailment that you might have. But, but there are some other promises that can apply here. In Romans 8 and 28, God had promised that all things work together for the good of those that conform to him to the image of Jesus Christ. So God has promised that he can use my health problems to make me more like Jesus. That particular promise can certainly apply almost to all outwardly hopeless situations that we face. God has promised in 1 Corinthians 15 that his children will one day get a transformed, resurrected body that will never get sick. So God has promised that whatever health issues that I'm dealing with are only temporary. And so even if God never heals me while I'm here on earth, I can have hope in the promise that the future resurrected body, that that's what I will have. What if, what if you're experiencing some difficulties? What if some of your promises from God's word might apply to you when you're experiencing these financial problems? In Matthew 6, Jesus promised that if we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that God will provide all our food, all our clothing for us. In Philippians 4 and 19, we, are pro we find the promise that God will supply all our needs. And obviously, this is the first step that's required that, that I'm constantly spending time in God's word. And so I can be aware of the promises that might apply to my particular situation. My brothers and sisters, only after I've taken the time to do that am I ready to take the second step. And that second step is that you've got to consider my circumstances. Abraham did not turn a blind eye to his circumstances. In verse 19, we see that he considered the deadness of his own body and the barrenness of Sarah's womb. See that verb, consider conveys the idea that giving careful consideration to something, today we might say Abraham had to face the facts. Even though people certainly lived a lot longer in Abraham's day, at 99 years old, Abraham was certainly past the prime of childbearing years. And at 89 years old, Sarah had gone through menopause and was physically no longer capable of bearing children. See, if you're, using, uh, if you're using the English Standard Bible, it translates you like this here. It says barrenness. And in verse 19, that indicates that it literally means a deadness. In other forms of the same word that, that, that describes Abraham's body as dead. And we see here in this particular moment, we see here that faith and hope do not as we often believe, lead to believe, requires us to deny and ignore the facts and the situation right in front of us. You see, my brothers and sisters, we see here that it's not in any way unspiritual to carefully consider our situations. 
You know, every now and then Christians get to the point where they say, I, I don't want to consider where I am, but you have to consider where you are. Abraham didn't just give a casual thought to his circumstances. Abraham, he carefully considered them. And he came to the correct conclusion that from a human perspective, there was no way that he and Sarah could have a child. By the world's definition, there was no hope. But yet, in the midst of a worldly hopelessness, Abraham still developed that kind of biblical help that led him to believe God. How, how did he do that? How did he do that? He didn't just stop at that point and, and, and have a pity party for himself. He moved to the next critical step, and that passage is that he contemplated God's power. You see, you got to understand God's power. And when you understand God's power, you know that God can do anything and everything but fail. And so in verse 19, we see Abraham did not weaken in his faith. When he considered the circumstances, and then in the 20th verse, we see that no unbelief made him weary or wavered from his concern of the promises of God. And that verse in particular caused me to stop to think about what Paul had written here. Abraham's faith was far from perfect. <laughs> there was an undoubtedly times in his life when his unfaith, unbelief had caused him to waver. Has there ever been a time in your life that, that even though you believed that something was going on in your life that caused you to waver in your faith, that caused you to start questioning God? Well, Abraham was the same way. It seems to me that Paul means here that is looking for an overall pattern of Abraham's life and certainly his final result. Abraham, he exhibited consistent faith in the promises of God. And that is, un that is unquestionably demonstrated when Abraham is obedient to God's command to sacrifice Isaac. The son who was the fulfillment of God's promise of Abraham. He was asked to sacrifice him. And as Abraham considered his dead body and Sarah's dead womb, he remembered that he had that God had made a promise to him. In verse 17, if we go back, give life to the dead and cause into existence the things that do not exist. Even Abraham couldn't bring back to life the deadness of his body. But God could. And even though Sarah couldn't bring new life into existence without the barrenness of her body, God could. Well, a pastor, a well-known pastor released a book some time ago It called The Power of I Am. In which he claims that we basically control our lives by making positive I am statements. The foundational principle of the book is that whatever follows that I am will eventually find you. And he goes on to suggest that if I am old, that wrinkles will come looking for me. But if you say that I'm young and healthy, the one who's most effective anti-aging treatment that you ever had. I, 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 uh, kids, uh, I, I kid you not that, that on the basis of a number of books that were sold, it is obvious that a lot of people believe that kind of message. They believe in that false hope. And if you were listening to us on, on Tuesday night for a Bible study, we talked about that false hope. And when you have that false hope, it's kind of hard to receive hope because you already believe in something that's not going to help you. Abraham was not merely an optimist who practiced positive thinking. He didn't figure that if he and Sarah would just, would just said, I am pregnant, that they would succeed in having a child. You, you, if he said, we are pregnant, that he would succeed. No, their faith was solely God-centered rather than man-centered. Abraham didn't believe in himself or the power of his word. He believed in the power of God who could do whatever was needed to fulfill the promise that he made. And so when Abraham exercised his faith, it was not merely belief in what God had promised. It was completely confident in the character of God. Who the character of God who is 100% faithful to do whatever he had promised and who had the power to fulfill those promises. Abraham had hope. Because he had, he had plugged into God's power. 
not his own. You see, every now and then we ought to pour, plug into what God's power and not our own. We think just because we got a few letters after our name that, that, that we've got the power. We think because we went to school and learned that we've got the power. We think because we live in a big house and, and drive the fancy cars that we've got the power. But if you depend on your own power, hmm, something else happens here. Something else happens here in the text. Uh, uh, Abraham contributes his part. You've got to contribute your part. Although the birth of Isaac happened because of that supernatural intervention of God, the fulfillment of God's promise required the participation of Abraham and Sarah. <laughs> Pastor, what are you talking about? In verse 21, we see that Abraham was fully convinced that God was able to do whatever he had promised. That's a perfect definition of the kind of faith that Paul had been writing in this section. And, and, and because he was fully convinced that God was able to carry out his promise, Abraham responded with obedience. You see, unlike the conception of Jesus, which was accomplished without a physical union, between Mary and Joseph, the birth of Isaac took place through a natural human process of conception. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. It took participation. And although we didn't find any details about what exactly happened in the scripture, as a result, the birth of Isaac confirmed that Abraham and Sarah both did their part. <laughs> There are two important things here to note here. That first, we, we often see that in order for God to accomplish his purposes in our life, we have to join in the work that he's already doing and do our own part. The other thing that we must see here that we note is that when our actions is entered into this process, we tend to do this backwards from what we see in the passage. When, when we come to what seems to be a hopeless situation, our natural tendency is to just jump in and act before we consider what God wants us to do through our circumstances. And then we just ask God to bless us when, when, what, what, what we've already decided to do without seeking the will at first. But as we clearly see here, we are only to act after we first consult with God's word. Consider my circumstances and contemplate God's power. And once again, let me give you a couple examples of what might work. I'll use the same situation that I used in the first principle. If I have a health issue, after I've taken the first three steps, contributed my part to what God wants me to do, that might take several different forms. It very well might be include that I need to go to the doctor. <laughs> I, I gotta contribute my part, my brothers and sisters. It very well might mean that I've gotta get tests done <laughs> and take whatever medication that's prescribed to me <laughs> that the doctor gives me for my treatment. <laughs> I've got to do my part. It very well may be that I got to get up in the morning and run. It very well may be that I've got to exercise and walk every now and then. I've got to contribute my part. It might mean taking some adjustments in my lifestyle in order to take care of my body. In some cases, it may mean accepting that you have no cure and submitting to God's will and using my circumstances as a witness to God. It very well may mean that I have to give up my way of thinking and think the way Christ is thinking. That's what it takes, contributing my part. But what about finances? What if you have finance problems? Once again here, there's several things that, that I might need to contribute my part. Perhaps I might have to be obedient to God and give up my first fruit. 
perhaps I need to be obedient and give my first and my best and entrust it that God has entrusted me and give it as my offering. Perhaps, my brothers and sisters, I need to be a good steward of the resources that God has already provided for me. That means cutting back on some of my expenses. That means not buying that pocketbook that you want. That means not buying those shoes that you might want. That means I've got to cut back on some of my expenses. When God has promised to give you or provide for my needs, he never promised that he would give us everything that we want. Every now and then, there's some things that we can't get. I might need an increase in my income by changing my job or taking some other part-time work or by going to work if I'm not already working. Obviously, God is capable of doing whatever, whenever, however he wants to. He can do it without me, but he'd like to have your help. But when we see consistently in the Bible, that God chooses to work through people and that he often invites us to join in the work he's already doing and contribute to that work. And the only way that we're going to be able to discern what God's part wants us to play in the process, we've got to turn to his word. We've got to go through his word. We've got to talk to him through prayer. How many of you talk to God through prayer? Every now and then, you've got to sit still and let God, let him control you. Mm. Now the next thing, now the next thing is confer God glory on God. You've got to put glory on God. In verse 20, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. That verb, grew strong, means to put power in. It's a form of a Greek word that is the same as an English word that means dynamite. But what is difficult to see from the perspective of a peculiar translation is that that verb is in a, a passive voice. Those that had English, it's in a passive voice rather than the active voice. That means that it's not Abraham who is doing the action, but rather someone else. And in this case, it's God who is doing the action to him. So literally, we could transfer the first part of the phrase like this, but his faith was empowered by God. This is so encouraging that whenever we face our situation that seems hopeless to us, God is at work in our lives to strengthen our faith. You see, faith is a gift from God and not merely something that we can develop on our own. Faith is a gift from God. And once we recognize that, the only logical response is to give glory to the one who gives us our faith in the first place and who continues to empower us with that faith. Now notice here, notice here that, that giving glory to God is not merely or primarily a matter of words. While we certainly can and, and should give glory to God by singing songs of praises like we did earlier in the service and honoring him with our words, giving glory to God is more a matter of how we live than what we say. You, you know our phrase, uh, uh, agape fellowship, uh, a place where love is what we do. It's not what we say, but it has to be what we do. Now... When I, went, when I go back to the account of God's repeated promises to Abraham in Genesis, and I could not find even one instance where Abraham gave glory to God with the words spoken. But what I did find is that Abraham consistently gave glory to God 
by living his life in a way that demonstrated the complete confidence in the power and the promises of God and in his character. But my brothers and sisters, this morning's message is really good news for us because anytime that we face the kinds of circumstances in our lives, when we understand that biblical hope is a matter of trusting the promises of God is greater than our predicament. It's greater than our situation. It's greater than our financial status. As we apply the principles that we've learned this morning, then God can turn our hopeless situations. He can turn our hopelessness into hope. He certainly did it for Abraham. And he wants to do it for you too. Whoever's going through something right now, if you turn it over to God, he will bring you through. That's why my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy lean on Jesus' name. Oh Christ, I said, oh Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is seeking sin. Oh Christ, oh Christ. On Christ! On Christ! On Christ! My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's stand to our feet. Stand to our feet. That even when you may be going through a hopeless situation in your life, and trust me, I believe that all of us, even me, there's sometimes that we feel like we don't see the answer. And we've got to put our trust. We've got to put our trust in something that we can't see. But if we have hope, that hope that believes and expects. See, we don't go with hope and saying, I hope, I'm wishing. But this biblical hope that I'm talking about is an expectation. You expect that God will. You expect that he's going to follow his promises. And when he follows his promises, you have kept the faith. See, that faith is keeping you, keeping you along the way. Some of us get, get faith and hope confused. Hope is that we know. Hope is... Our salvation. Hope. When our hope is built on Jesus Christ. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. If my, if my hope was built on. On my job. I could lose my job tomorrow. If my hope was built on my wife. She could walk out tomorrow. But God promised. He promised that he would never leave us. Nor forsake us. And so my brothers and sisters. Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe me? The one that made the heavens and the earth. That he would follow you. That he would keep you, sustain you. It was on Christ, the solid rock. I, I want to hear that, the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but rolling lean on Jesus' name. Come on, praise him. Leave our congregation as we sing, my hope is built. Nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Dare I trust the sweetest frame? 
sister, I like that. Give her another mic. Let's meditate on the word. Brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us this morning. Those out there in our virtual church and those that are right here in the sanctuary. We know that God has made a way out of nowhere, even in this pandemic. Some of you remember back in the early parts of this pandemic, the hospitals had portable morgues outside. And people were leaving and nobody understood. But a Christian ought to have believed that we had hope. That we would hope that this day would come. And we're not out of the we're not out of the woods, but we know that we got hope. We got hope. We got hope. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. May he rest food and abide with each and every one of us now, henceforth and forevermore. And the children of God said amen. 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 You may go in peace. You may go in peace. I need you to